And uh, I want to welcome you to Off Planet TV, Off Planet Radio. If you're getting the podcast side of this, um, websites are offplanetradio.com, offplanetmedia.net for the uh, television side of it, which we broadcast out on the Conscious Consumer Network out of the Netherlands. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, what we do from time to time is we sit down and have what we call a private session with uh, guests who bring to the table interesting perspectives on all the subjects that we talk about, whether it is the paranormal, spirituality, ufology, and, um, well, interestingly enough, my guest will bring all of that to the table in the course of this conversation tonight. Uh, he is a very well-known author and um, somebody I consider to be a person who has been at the crossroads in the modern era of human consciousness development. Um, he has a series of books out that deal with aspects of human consciousness development, and he has historically been in the place where history has been made for, I would say, the last 50 years. At least I want to welcome to Off Planet TV, Timothy Wiley. Welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Randy. Um, I, yes, it's a strange way to see one's life. Um, I haven't seen it quite in that perspective, but yes, you're quite right. I have found myself in some rather, rather interesting places over the years. I look at your, um, your history and doing research when I have a guest on. Um, I tend to look at the broad sweep of what they've done. And uh, I'm very interested in your early history, your early development. You uh, were an architect student in London and uh, began to have experiences and, um, I guess, uh, spiritual awakening. Can you give us a little bit of the background on, on your own history and your own uh, journey to where we are now, Timothy? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, this was in the late 50s, so um, uh, LSD had just been sort of, uh, had just really kind of hit the, hit the, um, uh, the specialist, I would say, uh -huh. uh, probably. Um, it was legal, of course, and, and a lot of us were, you know, very drawn to exploring it and experimenting with it. I found it extraordinarily helpful, for instance, in the design process. You know, when I was um, uh, an architectural student, um, but it also has opened a number of doors for me. Some very, very uh, difficult ones, because um, I'd been born in the war. And my first memories were having sort of bombs dropping around me. And I, I think I got pretty screwed up by that. Uh, of course, didn't really realize it um, until I did the acid. And, um, you know, <laughs> I'd be there, you know, uh, my, I'd be taking it with my girlfriend. She'd be absolutely happy and having some wonderful time. And I'd be in hell. And I'd be in absolute horror. Um, and it really got my attention. And since I'm a rather curious person, rather than saying, oh, no, I'm not going to do that again. I said, well, I'm going to do that again and find out what this is about. And, of course, that started really a journey uh, that I think we all take sooner or later, which is finding out who we are and why we're here and what went wrong, <laughs> what we did to deserve <laughs> being here. Because <laughs> this ain't, a, ain't a, an easy planet. Um, I'm told by my sources that it's actually known as the third worst planet in this particular local universe. Said yeah, that's not yeah. that difficult to uh, believe. Um, yeah. My gosh, taking LSD in the 1950s, you must have gotten some of the original batches from Mr. Hoffman himself. Well, I think I probably did. Actually, I had a girlfriend who was um, a, a model who used to come and go between New York and London, and she would bring it back 500 mics on a uh, on a sugar uh, sugar cube. Uh, oh, but, yes, it was delightful uh, and absolutely <laughs> horrifying as well. Um, but, you know, the thing I found is that a bad trip, you know, is actually the useful trip. That's the one that you really learn from. You know, the ecstasy and all that stuff and all the funny things that happen, that's kind of um, uh, artifacts, you know. The real stuff is finding out, you know, how did we get the way we are, you know, because... Even the most clear of us are pretty screwed up. You know. well, when we actually dig in and find find out, you know, who we are and <laughs> you know 
what we've done in our lives, and, and of course, what many of us are reincarnated. What have we done in previous lives, too? And it wasn't an accident that we came here. So the the LSD basically opens up a, a what I call an aperture, much like many entheogens. Um, it puts aside the normal conscious state and enables us to basically enter into the inner realms. Um, and, and you, you know, you said something interesting there, the bad trips are the most useful. Uh, I only ever did LSD twice. Uh, LSD was a phenomenon when I was a kid, um, in the in mm -hmm. 70s, but it was also at that point being synthesized heavily. And yeah. my memory of it was basically, I wound up being the trip sitter and watching people go through their, um, their trip trip syndrome and watching a human being go through that and you know being with them uh, it's also a, an interesting perspective I was a I was a meditator and an intuitive so a lot of times I found myself actually co-tripping with somebody without even taking the chemical substance right yes I imagine you're pretty empathic uh, uh, you know, since because these are the kind of areas you're interested in, and most of us do have to develop, uh, you know, our telepathic abilities. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that goes into a lot of different experiences as well. Um, oh, definitely. When did you first begin to experience, um, I will call them other beings, because there's a lot of classifications in that, in terms of uh, ET contacts, contacts with angelic realms, um, any uh, intuitive type experiences that you may have had, both as a young person and later on? Yes, um, I mean, a certain number of them. I didn't really discover um, the more sort of uh, transcendent details of them until I was a lot older and I was able to talk to my angels and find out, you know, what was going on in my life. Because certainly for the first 33 years of my life, I didn't believe in angels, you know. Um, I've had a few ET experiences. In fact, I had a very interesting one in my early 20s um, when we were all really completely convinced we were going to, you know, um, be subject to some atomic war, you know. Um, and we'd grown up, <laughs> we'd grown up in a war. We, we knew what these bombs did, you know. Um, we knew the getting under a under a table uh, or under a desk wasn't going to really help, especially if the desk was wood. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I think most of us were, were pretty bowed down by this. And I was walking down Wigmore Street one day off to um, my architectural uh, college. Uh, and I must have been kind of really thinking about that um, because I bumped into somebody, a youngish man, uh, and we did that little dance, you know, where you go to the left, you go to the right, you go to the left, you go to the right. And while he, we were doing that, he looked at me right in the eyes, very astonishing with blue eyes, and he pulled his finger up and he said, we can pick those rockets out of the sky just like that. And he kicked his fingers in front of my head, my face, and he walked off. And I knew, I mean, oh, I, right. I just intuitively knew I met my first extraterrestrial, you know. Um, Extraterrestriality wasn't a foreign concept to me, you know, in my early 20s. I had worked out for myself that it's a big universe, and I doubted very much if we were the only beings in it. Uh, so it wasn't a sort of an alien concept to me. But um, I just had that complete conviction, um, his conviction that they could beat the rockets out of the sky, and my conviction that he was an ET and he was telling me the truth. And, of course, it was many years later, you know, I think in the 90s, when the... A military over here were starting to admit that, yeah, you know, <laughs> the rockets and the silos had been turned on and off by ETs. And I think there were six or seven different um, incidents uh, on different silos, you know, where they had just simply turned it all off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's quite amazing. Um, yeah. and, and, and your encounter in this particular sense wasn't a gray or a, a, a reptoid. No. It was a seemingly human appearing being. Perfectly, yes, perfectly. 
perfectly normal. His eyes were very blue. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember he had fair hair. Um, but uh, no, he, no, he could have been Nordic. I, he could have been overlooked, you know, by Aniki. I, I had quite a long conversation with a young boy who was being overlooked by. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, this is New York Bennett Park, is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yep. Yes, this is detailed in your books, Dolphins, Extraterrestrials, and Angels, a book that That's I'm one. holding in my hand right now, which is actually a first edition of this uh, that I own. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you and I, I actually go back a long way, Timothy. We. You did. That's wonderful. <laughs> Good. Yeah, your contact with the young boy in uh, New York City was a touchstone for me because uh, reading it, it resonated with me in the sense that um, this is actually how a lot of times we're contacting other beings, seemingly normal encounters that suddenly turn the corner and can get very strange. Right. Yes, exactly. And I think one has to be intuitively ready for them in a sense open to it. You know, rather than just kind of um, immediately kind of dismiss it as uh, unlikely, improbable, whatever. I mean, we'd seen this UFO going over in New York. I mean, and it was it was almost laughably the standard UFO. The UFO I always draw it a UFO you would see in the movies. Uh, and you know, a number of us saw it. Um, I was with a couple of friends. Um, and they just sort of potted across the sky. And we waved at it, and it, it, it just wriggled a little bit in the sky when we waved it. And that gave me a clue. How do you tell the difference between a, an extraterrestrial, an authentic extraterrestrial craft, and a government craft? And the trick is you wave at them, and the government craft don't wave back. <laughs> the ETs tend to wave back. It's all very, it's very personal, isn't it? Yes, it yes, very, very much, much is. is. Uh, one of the things, things hold on, I got a little bit of echo there. Um, one of the things that uh, I've experienced over the years, I know, and for instance, you said something very interesting. I'm going to back up for a minute. You said that you kind of recaptured some of these memories in your 30s. That's not really unusual, and I think uh, that's something as well that I experienced was uh, recognizing encounters that I had even as a child um, later in life, regaining, I guess, memories, but also in um, recognizing that contact was kind of ongoing with different beings, and as we open up, we begin to be more receptive to that. Yes, and more useful to them as well, I think. Um, Yeah, and more useful to our friends. That brings us kind of into the um, the realm of um, some of the books that you've written. Um, certainly, the the present one that we're going to discuss a little bit as we go through this interview, which is the Helionics. Did I say that correctly? Is that how it's pronounced? Uh, uh, the Heli- Helianx. 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 Yes. And I'm afraid we just my phone just cut out a few moments ago, but um, I think I'm, I think I'm on. If we want to continue. Okay, you can hear me okay. Yes, I'm fine. Um, I don't know if you wanted to go in a little more into uh, that situation with the, the young boy. Yes, I absolutely uh, do. I'd love, I'd I'd love be, you to go into that. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, for instance, why you, know, why you, um, you know, got, uh, why, why it touched you, for instance. Well, I'll tell you. It touched me because when I read the story, I got, I got chills, and I actually just pulled the book out of my library um, several weeks ago when we were discussing this interview. And when I opened the book up, it was bookmarked. Uh, I had the page folded over. And I got the goosebumps all over again because I've had a number of encounters over the years with different intelligences, different beings that would have seemed to have been normal except that dimensionally, vibrationally, and in every other way, there was something right. very different about them. Yes. And yes. generally there's an impartation energetically, vibrationally, or intuitively. There's an exchange of information that occurs. It's sometimes yes. almost encoded in yes. uh, very interesting ways. And that story stuck in my head 
to the point where when I opened this book and I went back and I revisited it, I got the same chills from it again because it is such an authentic recounting of how we really do have contact with extraterrestrials outside of the what I will call the comic book, book version that a lot of people talk about. I mean, we've got a lot of... I don't discount anybody's authenticity or their experiences, but what I will say is that reality is sometimes much more subtle than um, the kind of stories that show up on the Internet. Oh, yes. Yes, I mean, there are so many different levels to it, aren't there? I mean, you get situations where, you know, five people will be in the car, you know, and three people will see a craft, and two people will have no idea what's going on. I yes. mean, yes. you know, it, it, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. I think probably what happened is that after the early failures of being able to sort of work anything out with the with the government, you know, the, the, the interchanges that happened in, I think, was, was it 53, 54 with the government, um, and they didn't really work out. Um, I think probably... What what they arranged to do was to you know to to, to make contact much more personal, you know, so we get it all over the world, you know, very specific people being contacted, and then that sort of um, echoing out from them. I think sooner or later everybody on the planet will have had their extraterrestrial experience. Absolutely, yes, I agree with you. Um, one of the one of the taglines for this show when I close my show out is the truth is out there, which is actually a line from the X-Files, but I follow it by saying the truth is inside you. I've yeah. also said that disclosure will not come by government revelation. It will come as each one of us has our own experiences and begins to also tap into our own intuitive modes to be able to access the yeah. the various beings and many people in my experience that i've talked to um there's actually an initiatory process that occurs i think as people make contact with each other we become more open to the experiences so in a yeah. sense we're we're all kind of each one sort of a catalyst for for experience by by being authentic about our encounters exactly yes i, I think I mean, this is something that I made an, an agreement when I started writing my book back in the early 80s, is that there's no point in me uh, describing these experiences I've been having um, if I don't tell exactly the truth as I see it, you know. Now, it may be, from some points of view, it may be mad, but as long as it resonates with the people it's meant to resonate with, yes. you know, just like it did with you, then it's done its work. You know, I don't mind people thinking I'm I'm crazy. You know, um, it's a good um, screen to operate from behind. You know, with the right people. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Back to the, it, the story yeah. about. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Well, no, <laughs> I was going to pick up on something you had said earlier, okay. which is how um, one can suddenly see things later in life and understand now. Let's go back to when I was born. I was born in 1940, when I just as the war was beginning. Mm -hmm. And my parents and, uh, moved me down from London to, um, to a village, which was almost completely in the flight line. But the doodle bugs, the V1s, were starting to take in, in, in 1942. So my first memories in 1942, 1943, when I was two or three years old, well, these damn doodle bugs. I don't know if you know the pulse jet things when it's loaded with bombs and everything like that. And they would putter across the sky, pop, 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 like that. And they weren't very good at sort of range finding because they had to uh, alter the amount of fuel in it in order to get the range right. So they were aiming for London. Of course, they never reached London. They would always come down on us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my first memories were being bundled under this apparently some sort of table with some sort of protective covering around it. And this, how the doodle bugs works, you get pop, 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 pop. And then when they stop, pop, 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 the engine would cut out. And then you would hear this, this roaring sound coming down. And I would absolutely, my whole little body, you know, three-year-old little body would contract and contract in terror. 
And what I found, what I found out when I started talking to my angels in my fifties was that I would be held by an angel. I would leave my little body, right, and I would be held and cared for by an angel. My little body would be terrified. That was a terror that was feeding back to me in those early acid trips. Yeah. Those were the inference, right? And I tell you, it took me about 20 years of, of ketamine because ketamine is much more um, helpful in terms of getting rid of imprints than acid ever was. Acid's too crazy. Ketamine was really, really, could really focus on on uh, on dealing with the um, with the you know suppressed uh, these these things which have been absolutely suppressed into the very fabric of our of our emotional body, you know. Explain for those who don't know what ketamine is. Uh, ketamine hydrochloride, it, it, um, it was a substance developed basically in the uh, Vietnam War uh, because it, it's, anesthetic, it's an anesthetic that doesn't depress the breathing system or knock you out right, mm. necessarily. So they could inject somebody with a bad wound and they would carry them off, and they, you know, they wouldn't need all the apparatus to keep the guys breathing, which you normally would do. So it became you know, a very useful anesthetic. And then it started to be used in hospitals because it was very effective and short-acting. Um, and then John Lilly and a number of other people discovered it, if you use very, very small doses of it, yes. you know, one-tenth of the dose that you would uh, use for a child, for instance, and it produced a very, very specific psychedelic effect. Um, but unlike the more plant-generated psychedelics, uh, entheogens, um, it was much more, I would say, con I wouldn't say controllable, the more sort of one could sort of cooperate or collaborate with the other side, with entities on the other side, in, in a way that um, I certainly couldn't on that end. Although I was aware of them too, I wasn't able to um, work with them in the way that one can with uh, with ketamine. So it's a very very useful substance, uh, and unfortunately, of course, you know the drug wars and everything like that. It's it's not easy to get hold of, and and I certainly wouldn't advise you be using it. But um, for somebody exploring these particular areas, uh, it's enormously helpful substance. In terms of. Um these these type of experiences, um, substance. Um, how about uh, psilocybin and uh, peyote and things like that? Did you ever find those to be useful? I found that almost every entheogen is useful in its own way. It's just a question of finding out what the uses are. Um, I found, for instance, peyote particularly helpful. Yeah. In, in talking to trees, um, trees have a great deal to tell us, yes, they do. and we generally can't hear it. But um, you know, or to your consciousness with, with peyote, and you can you can you can have quite long conversations with them. Although they do tend to talk, oh my goodness, um, hard to get a word in. Uh, psilocybin is, I found it the most wonderful substance. Um, I haven't used it much, maybe two or three times in my life, but I have heard that it is now being enormously valuable for, you know, treating some of the soldiers who are coming back and also treating depression. Yeah. Um, there really is a, uh, an entheogenic revolution going on behind the scenes right now as people kind of rediscovering what we lost when we, you know, when we pushed them all aside in the, in the late 60s. Yeah. So, so uh, the use of ayahuasca... And uh, DMT variants, or well, that's that's really quite the rage right now. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, it's a very wide range, and of course, you know, more coming out every day. Although I'm not really in that loop anymore. I found, you know, once I I kind of found what I was looking for, you know, and certainly developed this relationship that I've been developing over the last twenty years with this discarnate. Rebel Angel, um, who wanted to tell her story, and, and we kind of got together because I wanted somebody to tell my story, and I couldn't think of anybody better than somebody who had observed it from behind the scenes. 
And in fact, she was the angel who who actually had cuddled me when I was uh, two years old, who had taken care of me. And I had never known that. No. Now, this is the angel that's known as Georgia, is that correct? Georgia, yes. Yes, I call her Georgia. I have no idea what she calls herself. <laughs> yeah, they seem to have many names, don't they? Well, when you're telepathic, you really don't need a name. Right. more to do with vibes, you know, than names. Um, so I think, you know, we give them names more than they tell us who they yes, are. Yes, we require yeah. that more. Yes, we do. We're very... very uh, separated now in in all of the uh, all of your journeys through uh, different things and I want to talk a little bit if we can about the process church but uh, you've cited as major influences two books specifically um, the Arantia book as a dominant I, I think a, a kind of a, a dominant influence and also of course in miracles uh, tell me a little bit about your interaction with those two disciplines and uh, your takeaway from them? Yes. Um, well, I, I spent um, 13 years in this spiritual community, the process. And when I got out, I was in my late 30s. And I had by that time done quite a sort of wide variety of reading. I've always been a reader. And I read, have read quite widely in um, various different spiritual and religious traditions. So I kind of had a pretty good handle on, on what was going on. Um, and when I bumped into the Urantia book, well, firstly, I, <laughs> I think like a lot of people, I, I just simply couldn't read it to begin with. <laughs> I put it aside. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000, uh, 2,800. Oh, the thing's a monster. Ages. Yeah, if you it's drop it on your step. foot, you'll need a cast. <laughs> I think it's got more doorsteps. <laughs> <laughs> um, doorsteps, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but, but anyway, when I got into it, I realized pretty soon that this was, this was a genuine thing. It's an authentic thing. It, uh, it really is what it says it is, which is... Um, a series four basic books transmitted by the angels through a series of medium situations all the way through the early, from 1909 to about 1935 or something like that. Um, and it was given to us because the angels felt things were so confused. There was so much confusion going on. Abel Vlatsky was saying one thing, somebody else was saying another. Other people were tapping tables. You know, religions were springing up all over the place with different ideas. And the angels felt that, you know, we needed some really authentic material. Um, and it is authentic. That's what's really astonishing. You can really tell from the rhythm of the writing and the way things are phrased. This isn't a huge... This is, this isn't a, isn't a human intelligence. This is, this is another intelligence. And I have had the advantage of two things. One is a near-death experience in which I had actually encountered angels when I was in my 30s, and also starting to work with dolphins and coming to the realization that these were extremely intelligent um, creatures. It's just that the nature of their intelligence was very different from ours. It moved ten times faster than we did, for instance. So we never get it. We never catch what they're trying to say to us because it's going too fast. Um, so I had kind of grown, I, I become accustomed to the fact that there are different intelligences. Um, and that was really helpful in, view, in dealing with the Urantia book because it, you really can tell pretty quickly that um, there's something of enormous wisdom and intelligence behind it. But I don't, it's not, I don't really, I use it as a platform more than, um, you know, it's the truth, it's the absolute truth. It's not, no. It's something that's been given to us to work with. It's a lot of information, um, much more than most of us can handle, and it'll probably be around for another 200 years and still be absorbed by people. Um, and I've even heard of um, at least two extraterrestrial groups who have tried, <laughs> who've taken it away and then given it back. So obviously it's creating some buzz in me. It's interesting that you say that, that you, 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 you cite it as a platform. Um, I've only come into contact with the Arantia book 
over, I would say, the last five years. And uh, I've read it off and on, um, sometimes put it down and just shook my head in amazement at the density of information that's in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It definitely, uh, well, let's just, just take a common touchstone, which is the Bible. The Bible gives us this disjointed kind of, I guess, missing pieces picture of some aspect of human history retold by, by certain races of people. But well, yes. it doesn't well, fill in the picture. What your rancher does is it gives you excruciating detail, almost more uh -huh. detail than you can handle. But it also gives us a picture that we've not seen both of humanity and a wider cosmology, which then kind of triangulates into your work with the angels and with the dolphins as well, because this interweaving cosmology seems to inform our consciousness in a way that we've not had before. We've been, I don't know how you feel about this, Timothy, but my whole life I've sort of rejected this flat, two-dimensional perspective of humanity, of linear time, uh, these cardboard figure roles that we're all given, this idea that somehow our life is this, this um, entry into this three-dimensional world and then the terminus back out of it. I, I, I view it much more holistically. And so for me, a book like the Arantia book is exactly what you said, a platform. It is a place to play in a little bit, kind of bounce yeah. off that a little bit. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, we know our, our consciousnesses are expanding, and this gives us uh, a context within which to expand uh, in the kind of more reliable ways than, for instance, of Blavatsky, you know, who you never really quite know, you know, is it real or is it memorized, you know. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you say it's excruciating in detail. Yes, it is. But I think it's meant to last for a very long time. Um, as I say, I think people are going to be reading it, you know, in 100, 200 years and still kind of, you know, coming to bits that they're trying to work out what it all means. Um, and I think not only the hint that another extraterrestrial race wants to have a look at it is, I think, a very interesting um, sidebar to it. Uh, it kind of means that we're rather a significant planet in a way that we've got this information. Yes. I don't yeah. think a lot of other planets know it. Yeah, it's, 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 that's something that has struck me too, is that there's something about this world, there's something about this race that's kind of a big deal in the cosmos. I don't understand yeah. it, but I get that sense. Exactly. Um, and for instance, and to go back to the issue we were talking about earlier, which is kind of, you know, some kind of understanding of how we fit into the larger framework. I mean, okay, it's one thing to know that we must we must be living in an inhabited, an inhabited universe. The next step, of course, is how do we fit into that? And I think the Arantia book is very helpful in this. Now, what it tells us is that about 203,000 years ago, there was a rebellion among the angels who are specifically entrusted to take care of this planet and a whole series. It's basically called, um, uh, um, uh, I can't remember. Anyways, there's, there are a thousand inhabited planets, right, are kind of overseen, you know, from the inner worlds by uh, specific angels who are sort of, um, you know, in, in, in instructed to do this by the sort of what I call MAR or multiverse mm -hmm. uh, administration, the larger sort of uh, administrative frame. And uh, this rebellion, right, affected this planet and also another 36 other planets, right? So we've basically been cut off from the larger sort of universe frame for a very, very long time, for 200,000 years. You know, we've been isolated and quarantined which is why we don't see kind of extraterrestrials coming and going. We, we're not aware of our angels, which is probably true on most you know, third-dimensional planets. Um, the, the extraterrestrials coming and going, visiting tourists, you know, and whatnot. Um, and there'll be um, you know, an, an awareness of angels 
uh, we here you know, have been incredibly isolated and been thrown back onto our own devices. You know, you can work it out for yourself. And of course, it's much more complex than that because the planet also has angels that take care of, you know, oversee the planet. And um, the angels who oversee this planet are also sided with the, the, the rebel faction, which makes it, you know, a double whammy. Um, you know, so we really have produced a very, very difficult, difficult situation. Now, if I can just take it one step further, why is this planet, you know, be almost tailored for difficulty. I mean, if you really look at history, it's almost like everything that could have gone well actually didn't go well. The various interventions that happened, almost all of them went wrong for one reason or another. The purpose behind this appears to be the, uh, the incarnation of the overall um, it's not exactly created deity, but it's a kind of a sub-creator, if you like. Um, this sub-creator right, is required to incarnate in all seven of his um, orders of sonship, if you like, order, orders of, of angelic uh, offspring. Right? And the seventh, the last of, the, of this incarnation, has to be um, on a mortal, in a mortal. And out of the 10 million planets that this particular entity takes care of, right, this was the planet, believe it or not, chosen for the seventh incarnation. Right? And, of course, as you know, the incarnation was as uh, Jesus Christ, um, and it explains a great deal about uh, exactly why this entity has had so much profound effect. You know, uh, I, mean, I say profound because, of course, terrible things have been done in his name and wonderful things yeah. have been done in his name. Yes. But there is quite clearly a, um, a, very, a very specific difference in between Christ and in between a lot of the other avatars. Um, there's just a very different vibe. If you go in in the inner levels, you'll find it's a very different vibe between uh, Christ Michael and between, for instance, uh, the Buddha or um, any of the other. Uh, yeah, Krishna or uh, yeah. 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 yeah, Buddha. So in terms of, of that incarnation, that incarnation was sort of the ultimate incarnation in terms of, what, instructing, guiding humanity? Well, not so really much that. More the idea of experiencing what it is like to be a human being, right? As he had to experience what it was like to be a um, seraphim. You know, or, or you know another uh, order of angel, um, but it wasn't so much to to really kind of change anything. Um, it was more of a sort of personal thing, you know, which you know simply because he was who he was, you know, had an enormous sort of public ramifications. So you don't, you didn't really view this as like, a, well, the traditional uh, son of God came to earth, has three and a half years, and then uh, he's uh, prosecuted and uh, found guilty and tortured and put on a cross and then rose on the third day kind of thing. Well, that's a very shorthand version. It's, it's, it's um, the best, yeah. It's, <laughs> no, I mean, I think by the time I was 11, I, I had kind of, uh, rejected all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, actually, what happened to me was, as, you know, I think like a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, any kind of capability of thinking through things, you know, by the age of 11, I had really you know, become an atheist. And it was only, I think, probably the LSD and, and some other situations that um, introduced, uh, you know, introduced God, God to me, you know. So when people say, well, 
you know, what's the best way of finding God? I, I think probably the best way is to is to reject God, because then you get so firmly kicked in the pants that you can't help you can't help understanding it. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you on that. I, uh, oh yeah. I've gone through that experience. I actually went through it a couple of times when I was about fourteen, mm. and I was actually at that point becoming aware of let's just say the effects of being intuitive in a world that's very noisy <laughs> psychically yeah. Yeah. Um, and having ET contacts and having a lot of strange things around me, but at the same time going, religion does not explain any of this. Religion is not useful. And that's, that's exactly what it was. Um, yeah. The Western institutions of religion and science and medicine at that time to me seemed um, hostile in understanding for me personally what was going on in my life and yeah. even in terms of a worldview again it became this kind of flat space thing that I frankly knew better than to accept prima facie exactly exactly it's a challenge isn't it I think um, I mean I think it's much more useful to understand the planet as an intelligence accelerator or as a sort of a teaching machine you know, it's a it's part of a university. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. Um, An intelligence generator. That's a that's a great way to look at it. Yes, and we can either go up or we can go down. So let me kind of segue yeah. into. Are you still there with me? I know we're getting. Hello. What's it? Hello. Oh, okay. Every once in a while, I think one of us drops out. I'm not sure which one it is. Right. <laughs> um, but we're given a decent lifetime, you know, basically to, to run through a number of things and get things right. Uh, I think to live any longer would be very painful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it becomes almost too hard to contemplate living. Um, by the time one's 40 yeah. or 50, one should know how to deal with most of the things that come at you in life. Which kind of brings me to another situation, because um, I've read and even heard in some cases, because I've listened to a few of your other interviews, um, reincarnation. What is that? Because I think most people who, eat, well, first off, there are many people, because established Christianity, for instance, does not accept reincarnation, which I'm baffled by because it's clearly in the Bible. But the people who do accept reincarnation take it as a given that we have all been reincarnated. But what I hear you saying is that, in fact, we have not all been reincarnation, reincarnated. How, how exactly do you view that as working, Timothy? Well, there, there are two levels to it. I mean, the first level is if you are reincarnated, you kind of know it. I mean, by the time I was, I think, probably 25, I had two or three situations which I could really only explain in terms of, you know, I've known these people before, you know, um, in quite some detail. Yes. Um, so the that aspect was a personal experience. But now, the Arantia book says an interesting thing is uh, reincarnation is not a technique practiced in this particular zone of the, the universe. So I think the next step is that I find myself, and have always found myself, extremely different from most of the people who are around me, my family, blah, 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 the people that I was at school with. I've always been an outsider. I've always been weird. I've always been... You know, I guess you probably went through pretty much the same thing. You know, a psychic person, a sensitive, you know, in a, in a um, an ocean of insensitivity, you know. Um, yes, yes. And a, and a very noisy, I, you know, to me it was noisy because oh I can God, walk, yes. you walk into rooms and you absorb all of this. Okay, and for that yes. reason alone, you're, you're you know... You, you wind up inviting all kinds of diagnosis from the uh, disciples of Sigmund Freud about your mental state when, in fact, what you're doing is, you know, you're absorbing a lot of energy, a lot of voices, a lot of vibrational forces, and, you know, yeah, it makes you also want to be isolated. Yes, 
guess it does. I live on my own in, in the desert. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's a good reason for that. I mean, I have less material friends uh, to play with. Uh, but yes, it, it, it is a difficult one. So, what, what I started to understand is that some people reincarnate, but most people don't. Right. And bless them. Uh, I, being a reincarnated is a happy thing, I assure you. Um, <laughs> You know, it's a question of going on and on trying to get things right. Yeah. But normal people, people I call first timers, you know, their, their, their soul is basically created on this level, and then they have eternal life from then on, you know. And you know, they're sweet people; they're lovely. Um, but they're not. They're not me. They're not like me. <laughs> they're not like the sort of people I've discovered. And after lots and lots of sort of trying to understand and moving in and out and traveling around the world and talking to all these various different people, I started to sort of understand that what is going on is that the angels who sided with the rebels back back when right, are, being, are being given the opportunity to reincarnate as mortal beings, as beings on the world that they have affected in order to experience right, the outworkings of the decisions they made in rebelling. Right? And so we're getting basically, I mean, my sources tell me there are now about 120 million uh, reincarnate rebel angels on the planet at the moment. And more wow. coming in every day. Wow. More coming in every day, really. <laughs> so it's you're, so many. this goes into a really interesting aspect of what you've talked about. The idea that these rebel angels are basically now being given a chance to, I guess, I don't know, work out some sort of situation to vindicate themselves? Yes. It's a, well, it's more, it's more a personal redemption. Um, I mean, I've said a few times now that the universe is much more personal than we think it is. I mean, we think it's all the sort of, you know, that it's not, it's extremely personal, which is why... You know, Christ's incarnation was a very personal thing. Why uh, ETs contact us in very personal ways. Um, and I think the same thing. So when you say all these angels are coming in now, is that because of this particular period that we're in? Are we... A lot of my, people... My... Go ahead, please. Well, sorry, well, Georgia tells me, and you know, in the course of writing this book together, is that they started coming in in very small numbers during the times of the later times of Atlantis. Okay. Um, and then they came in dribs and drabs, one or two here, half a dozen here. But the Cathars, I think, were probably one of the big collection, one of the biggest groups of them who came in as a collective. Um, and then there was a big withdrawal, and then in the 15th, 16th century, uh, there, were, there was a certain number came through, and then there was a withdrawal again, and then the, you know, in the 18th and 19th century, there were some more came through, um, and then through the 20th century, uh, I think probably after the Second World War, it started coming in in very large numbers. Uh, until now, as I say, we have about 120 million. Now, by Cathars, do you mean what we know historically as the heretical sect that was snuffed out by Rome back in back in the 14th century? It's a little more complicated than that, yes. But yeah, I'm sure those it ca is. Those Cathars. Yeah. <laughs> those Cathars, yes. They were actually interested. They did believe in reincarnation. Yes, they did. And they, they, they understood why, too. You know, they understood the world has to go on reincarnating until I got it right. So why is it that some entities have to keep reincarnating until they get it right, and other beings have what we would call one mortal life, and basically, boom, they're out of here and on to um, what I guess we would call eternity or immortality? Well, yes, I mean... You know, we're, we're all eternal beings, put it that yes, way. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, they die. They have their, their after death review. You know, there are these uh, bardo levels or um, these narrative levels, which are kind of introductory levels to the inner world um, and compensatory levels too. If somebody has been extremely poorly treated in this incarnation, in this lifetime, they generally get a really nice, nice time you know, when they get out. <laughs> Um, and equally, for people who didn't uh, didn't get the point, uh, they have a chance to uh, to be on the other side of things, if you like. Um, have a chance to realize what it's like to uh, be on the other side of what they dealt out. It's very fair. It's all very fair. It's, and it's about learning. You know, a person who now treats another person is basically ignorant, right? because they don't understand the universal law. They don't understand that sometimes they're going to get treated in that way too. But it's going to be worse for them. You know, and I actually think that's a really important point to go into. We, we live in this world right now, which appears to be run by a class of people who I can't describe any other way than frankly being psychopaths. They are the people who run the banks, they run the military industrial complex, they run the scientific and educational establishments, they are the people who create wars, economic turmoil, poverty, sickness, disease. Um, can I, can I, can I, can I, yeah, can I just, please. I'm slightly going to rejig that, um, because it's not so much that they're psychopaths, although they are, it's that the systems that they've inherited have driven them to psychopathy. It's the only way of being able to, you know, be in, be in charge these days. Um, so it's a different thing. You know, they have to basically, you know, sacrifice themselves, you know, um, because, I mean, not only is this planet really screwed up, is that they were coming out of that period of screwing up. So all the things that have been, all the corruption that's been baked into the systems that we've been living by for the last... 200,000 years um, are being revealed, are coming out to the surface, like boils, you know, coming yeah. out to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so things look really awful, but really what it is is, you know, all this suppressed stuff coming out. And we just have to ride it. Ride it out. And in dealing with that subject, you know, I kind of went off on a screed there for a minute, but mm -hmm. I'm also... Mm -hmm constantly trying to find a way to compassionately deal with those aspects and understanding that level of evil must have some kind of bounce back to it how do we deal with that how do we how do we cope in a world that seems to operate this way and when you isolated that idea about the system i totally agree with you that we have a sick system and i notice a lot of people are trying to fix the system i don't think you can fix it no, I, and I don't think it's about fixing it, really, you see. I mean, think of it more as a school, um, you know, where, things, where the conditions are really, really difficult. But they're difficult for a purpose. They're difficult because we have to grow up in order to, we have to confront these situations in order to grow up. You know, we need these situations. So I think the most compassionate way of looking at it is that they are sacrificing themselves. You know, um, unknowingly, you know, unconsciously, uh, and if they, you know, if they do deliberately mean horrible, bad things, you know, then yeah, they will, they will, they will pay for it. They will, uh, they will have to, you know, have to deal with what it's like. Um, but if they're just part of the, you know, the the corrupt mechanism, um, I, can, I think one can only be compassionate. Poor sods, you know. There's currently a lot of uh, revelation of, you know, frankly, some of the more base nature of the system related specifically to um, the outing of high-level pedof pedophiles within government and religious positions, um, the malicious use of economics and things like that. Is this all part of that purging process? Is that what we're... We're, we're seeing as this plays out in, in the media? Yes. Yes, exactly. It's all part of the purging process. 
And I would imagine that the number of the people who are in these key positions are very likely reincarnated, very likely um, rebel angels. Now, I should say the thing about this rebel angel business uh, incarnate is that they don't know, people don't know that that's who they are, that's their heritage, right? They just feel they're very different. Um, and some take, you know, very negative course. Some get the point and, and, and realize that, you know, um, that we're here to redeem ourselves. We're here to do good and to um, help other people. Uh, and that will probably be the last incarnation for them. They'll be able to get off the wheel, you know, and enjoy, basically join humanity. You see, what's so interesting is that the relationship of the angels with humans, right? Why do the angels serve humans? I mean, I wouldn't serve humans. <laughs> the angels serve humans yes. because we are indwelled by the God. Angels aren't indwelled by God. They're a direct manifestation of the Mother Spirit. Right? So when, they, when we believe they're serving us, actually they're serving the God within us. You know, who act, you know, as we rise up in our ascension, you know, we kind of become one with this, uh, this entity, you know, and a lot of other things as well. Um, but that's rather a wonderful sort of balance, and that's why the angels love us so much. <laughs> but as you point out, they do serve us, and yet, uh, and we see this, you know, I, I, I've not been able to make the distinctions between entities that have been in my life, with a few exceptions, uh, as being angels or helpers or elders or sages or wise men, it's very difficult to discern the... As you're often. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess what I'm saying is we're aware of them. And, you know, I always loved the scripture in the New Testament that says about entertaining, entertaining angels unawares, which goes yeah. back to... What we were talking about with your encounter with the um, the boy extraterrestrial in Bennett Park and yeah. a lot of the other encounters we've had, uh, there's really not a strict differentiation a lot of times. But we know, for instance, that extraterrestrials are not angels. Is that correct? True, yes. The best way of understanding it is that uh, the universe is divided into two very, very broad sways, right? There are the inner worlds of the angels and the outer worlds of the extraterrestrials. The outer worlds are the worlds we can touch and, you know, look at through telescopes and everything. And the inner worlds are the inner worlds of the imagination, right? Now, we have a very crude idea of the imagination. We think, you know, we, it's imaginary, but of course it's not. The imag imagination can be used for imaginary things. We can make up things. But it's actually more like a two, it's more like a sort of, um, uh, a two-way mirror, you know, uh, you can you can get information through the imagination, um, and it's within that realm, the inner realm, uh, that the angels uh, exist. And the angels, kind of, they're the administrators of the universe. Right? So you could say that extraterrestrials, of course, have angels too. Um, some are aware of them, some aren't. Angels aren't here to live our lives for us, you see. And the angels aren't with the extraterrestrials to live the extraterrestrials' lives for them. They have their lives, they're on a learning curve, just like we are. It may, they may be in a higher class, more erudite information, but they're still learning. I mean, I don't know if you know about this Verdant thing, the Verdants, who uh, they came in the late 90s, and uh, because came when they were going to kind of help us and had all these tremendous plans, you know, and they were going to make universities and, and make, you know, barren land fertile again, had all these great plans. And I think about two years, it took about two years to kind of get the point that they really were kind of not welcome, you know, that they were really poaching on somebody else's turf. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so they withdrew, I think, um, you know, they withdrew in the early, early part of the century. I, I think as humanity, we take a lot on ourselves in terms of guilt and blame about the condition of this world. How much of our present condition can we attribute without passing the buck or letting ourselves off the hook too easily? 
how much of our condition can we attribute to that original rebellion that occurred what over what 200,000 years ago is, is that a yeah. fair number yes I, I think we can say all of it uh, I mean we have been receiving covert help um, from the inner planes uh, you know we haven't blown ourselves up we haven't you know made the planet completely uninhabitable um, and yeah. I don't think we would be necessarily allowed to mm -hmm. uh, I mean yes yeah, so I agree with that a, I agree with that you know, what's the value in an uninhabited uninhabitable planet you know what's the value of a school room when the school <laughs> schools close down um, so yeah I think uh, I think it's, it, it, it's all part of a wonder city I mean you know, we, we say, well, is, for instance, uh, you know, is all this caused by humanity? Well, yes, of course it is, but we're part of nature. I mean, we're all part of this one thing. It's not just us. And, you know, we believe that we've been living in a closed system, but of course we aren't living in a closed system. We're living in an open system. Uh, and anything, anything can happen. <laughs> How so when you say we're we're in an open system? Because it doesn't feel that way. It feels like a quarantine. It feels like what one talk show host euphemistically terms a prison planet. Are, are we, in fact, much freer than we think we are? Have we not exploited our potential enough? Or are we heading to a place where we're about to break through that, that ceiling? Well, I think there's two questions there. Um, oh, there's at least three. There's probably a dozen. <laughs> I guess. Well, to, uh, to answer the last one first, um, yes, I think we are. Uh, we are getting close to breaking through. Um, I mean, it's a curious one, because I think probably every generation probably thinks that. I mean, the generation that, you know, around Jesus, you know, thought the world was going to end. Um, so I think probably every thoughtful generation probably thinks things can't get much worse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're getting to a point where they really can't get much worse. Um, you know, the seas are not in a good state. Uh, I mean, we all know what's happening to the planet. Uh, it's probably much more serious than we've been told. Uh, so, um, I, I think probably we're getting pretty close to, you know, D-Day or the Omega point or whatever, whatever you call it. Well, consider for a minute, 2012, the Mayan calendar and all of the hype that went into that. And I was doing live radio in 2012. I did a whole series of interviews on it. And it was all over the place, what people were expecting, everything from Armageddon to uh, humanity having its, uh, its kund kundalini moment. But at the end of that process, and, you know, I believe something did happen, I think, there were certain things that shifted at that point. But I know people who were pissed off because the world didn't end. I know people who were pissed off because they didn't get their light body. It was all over the place. What really did happen or what didn't happen within that period? Or are we in a much longer process than most people would like to imagine? Well, yes, we're certainly in a much longer process. Yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, we're in, we're in an enormous process. Uh, I mean, just the concept of being an eternal being is an, enough to <laughs> blow anyone's mind. We can barely imagine it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, I think things are coming to a, uh, to a head. It's really fascinating. I, I, I mean, you know, when you say some people were pissed off at this, something. The view then was much more to do with the psychology of the people, you know, who were who were involved with it. Um, I've been around dolphins long enough to know that the big one of our big problems as humans is expectations. Right? We build in our imagination what we want to happen, mm -hmm. and then when it doesn't, as it most often doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, once again, more depression. Oh Lord, you know. Blah, blah, blah. So the best thing is not just not to make any expectations, just don't accept anything. Just know that everything is fine. You know, we're all on course. Everything's being taken care of. You know, and if one's taking care of one's own particular environment and one's own little world and one's friends and lovers and relatives, you know, um, then 
everything's just moving along fine. And just not to get involved. I mean, yes, all this dreadful thing is going on. But, you, you know, the, <laughs> let them do it. Let them, let them, let them you know, throw bombs at each other if that's what they want to do. Um, can't stop people doing what they want to do. Yeah, that's absolutely more, true. Yeah. Any more than we would want people to stop us doing what we want to do. Um, just let them do it, you know. Get it over with. Yeah. That kind of brings us into a subject I wanted to touch with you on, and it goes in to your own experience with the Process Church. And <clears throat> I don't want to spend a lot of time on it unless you would like to explore it more, but I know you've talked about it in other venues. But in terms of understanding this this distinction, uh, the Process Church was basically labeled by, um, well, Vincent Bugliosi, among others, as being connected to the Manson. Uh, Actually, oh. Bugliosi Bugli uh, didn't. Uh, it was he proved that we weren't. And okay. It was Manson. Okay. Yeah. See so how stories get bent and distorted yeah. on the internet. Probably I, I don't I don't check it out. I imagine so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the issues, you see, we were we were quite a secret. We were a mystery school basically, mm -hmm. and we were very secretive. But when you make yourself secretive, other people project, you know, their worst ideas. You know, so we become people who eat dogs. We love dogs <laughs> better than we do, you know, uh, and so on and on and on. And we had nothing to do with Nansen at all. I mean, the only thing we had to do with Manson, right, was two years after he'd been in prison for two years, we we did a magazine on death, and we thought to, and when we do a mag when we did magazines, we would always try and do both sides of things, right? So we took, uh, we thought, well, who'd know more about death? Oh, well, Charlie Manson, probably. So we sent a couple of people off to interview Charlie Manson, and another couple of people off to uh, interview an eminent English uh, Catholic. <laughs> um, and we put to them, and of course, this led to everybody mm -hmm. saying, you know, blah blah blah. We know we had nothing to do with it. It was a, it was basically a wonderful training. I suspect it was probably intended for incarnates like like myself and a number of others. And I suspect a number of these little spiritual groups or cults, if you like, you know, are intended to kind of, you know. Um, Produce it. You see, what a cult does, or what a group does, it, it allows you to experience the kind of things you don't experience under normal conditions. Right? You can experience things absolutely to the extreme, just as people go to war to find out who they are by taking themselves to the extreme. We actually took ourselves continually to the absolute extreme, so we would find out who we were, you know, in that way. And after 13 years, I had enough. And, uh, and uh, so how am I in life? But it was very valuable training. Very hard work, very hard. Um, but very, very, very valuable. Now, you were the designer for the Process magazine, which um, <clears throat> lent itself, I guess, to your artistic skills gleaned in architecture school? In part, yes. And in part through um, entheogens as well. Okay. I mean, what surprised me, um, I had no idea what was going on in San Francisco, you know, with the uh, the magazines out there, that particular style that they were oh, using. Oh, yeah, that was an amazing... I, I was using pretty much the same style. I had no idea. That we were I noticed doing that, it. too. And I'm actually, a, I'm a fan of that year. I'm a fan of the poster art that came out of, for instance, the Fillmore and uh, yeah. Avalon. And that yeah. whole... Uh, wild, explosive graphic yep. style that seemed to spring out of the psychedelic mindset. Now, I was, Absolutely. I was, I was a young teenager at that point, and I was an art student, and I emulated a lot of that style in illustrations. I was actually illustrating hand-drawn underground comic books and magazines at that point in time. How running, cool! running them off on uh, mimeograph machines and other types of printing. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck, even looking at the cover of Dolphins, Extraterrestrials and Angels, you had a style that was developing that had, I don't quite know how to describe it, it's abstract, and yet at the same time, 
it has a continuation to it that seems to draw the eye into a place where it it focuses on something that's my words fail me here uh, i'm going to hold this up to the screen for our viewers to see this because that's the front cover of that of the uh dolphins extraterrestrials and angels our guests can't see the screen right now but i'm holding this up because it is the, the cover of this book actually brings us into the artwork in uh, the Helionx proposition, which is something I want to talk to you about very much. The, um, the artistic background of this work and the influence on the entheogens, but also the, um, I guess, the gestalt behind that style of graphics, which is you just pointed out seems to have almost exploded out of some sort of collective consciousness. Yes, yes. How interesting. Well, I, I never thought of it in those, in those terms, but I think you're absolutely right. Because, because it actually really changed graphic design in, in, in every way, didn't it? If you think of how, you know, magazines started looking, you know. Uh, it broke all the rules, first off, I because... Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I was being trained by art teachers who were coming out of two worlds, either uh, the world of classical art or the world of commercial art as it was done in the 1950s and the 1960s. And mm -hmm. I was designing Dayglow mobiles, three-dimensional right. hanging objects designed mm -hmm. to be viewed with black lights. And, sure. and then trans trying to flat space that onto graphics. And I had art teachers tell me that you know, this is not the way things are done. It's not proportional. It's not styled <laughs> correctly. Your your lettering style isn't consistent. Because um, one of my interests was actually in what, again, goes into the Helionx <clears throat> proposition is your calligraphic work, which I think is hugely important to the style of this book. And we'll, we'll throw some graphics up as we go through this video. But what I'm trying to drive at is that the art that you've produced over the years seems to have a very consistent flow to it in terms of coming from that style and then developing into the something that became a narrative that culminates in in the Helionx proposition. Well, that's a very kind observation. Um, actually, in a sense, the Helionx pages, uh, you know, were probably completed maybe about 15 years ago. Um, so, you know, I've, I've taken things probably a lot further since then. Uh, but, but, yes, I think one of the things that helped me, and I don't know, you probably got a comment on this, is that I determined, because I also play music, I, you know. Yes. I, I would, <laughs> it's not, mm -hmm. obviously, like everywhere. <laughs> but I decided when I was young that if I played music professionally or if I, if I um, did art professionally, it would ruin me. Right. And so I decided just to do it for, my, for myself. <laughs> I just got goosebumps. I just got goosebumps. Because, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try, and make, try and make one living at something that isn't easily perverted by others. And I found that writing is the best way of doing it. Because if I find a good editor, and my editors at the institutions are wonderful, um, you know, I can say what I want. And I have. I mean, you know, in all my books, I've said exactly what I wanted to uh, be. Never had to bow to anybody. You've written a lot of titles. They're rather diverse. I, I don't have a fix on how many books you've written. Um, but... Not that many. Um, I would, when I started back in the, in the early 80s, I thought what I'd do is I'd write a book every 10 years and describing some personal experiences, right, of going around the world and talking blah, 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 and going through these various different experiences, the impact of the non-human intelligences we're having, you know, what, what were the influences the dolphins were having, what were the influences the angels or the extraterrestrials were having. And I decided to write a book every 10 years, which I did. I right, for one um, extra, dolphins, uh, extraterrestrials and angels in the 80s, and then in the 90s, uh, Adventures Among Spiritual Intelligences. And then in the this century, um, Adventures Among Spiritual Intelligences. Um, 
and the um, the Return of the Red Dog Angels. Right, that was the third of those books. And when I finished that, um, I'd also written a couple of other books. One on uh, one a collaborative work called Ask Your Angels, which actually became very popular and made enough, made me enough money to build a house. It's nice. Good. Um, and another book on the process uh, called Love, Death, Sex, and Fear. Those words in another order, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's the Feral, was it the Feral House publication? That's the Feral House yeah. one, yeah. yeah. But now, all through, all through this, all through my 40s and 50s, I was getting, gradually being contacted by this disincarnate rebel angel that I call Georgia. And we spent about sort of 10 or 15 years kind of getting to know each other, and kind of, obviously, you know, uh, kind of quite a lot of trust <laughs> issues going, um, you know, because one doesn't want to really hang around with a, a just kind of rebel angel, you know, I mean, if one to believe the, you know, the Catholic rap on them. Um, but anyway, we got to know each other over the years, and... Uh, I had been wanting to try and write something about this rebellion, you know, how the rebellion among the angels has rippled down through history and how I, I feel a rebel, a natural rebel, and how my friends feel natural rebels, you know, what's happening in the Middle East and everybody, everybody rebelling. So I really kind of um, wanted to try and really get interested in that. And then Georgia said, well, you know, she said she'd been here half a million years, and she's seen everything that's been going on, really she's seen a lot of what's been going on. And she said she wanted to try and tell her story and trying to unravel everything that's gone wrong in her, you know, in her perception. So I said, well, okay, let, let's see if we can do a bargain here. I'm pretty bored with bored writing about myself, <laughs> but since you've been with me in this lifetime, mm -hmm. and I discovered later in a number of other lifetimes, uh, why don't you tell my story through your eyes? You tell me all the things that I don't know. I didn't know what happened. I, I, behind my back. <laughs> so, um, you know, we started writing um, about four years ago, and I think it took us two years to write eight volumes of this, of which three are already published. Fourth, fourth is coming out in a few months' time. Fifth is coming out next year. And if my noble publishers continue, um, the, other, the other three will come out. Uh, it's fascinating for me because I'm learning an awful lot of stuff that was going on behind my back. I had no idea what was going on. This is fascinating. So, so that's what happened. <laughs> that's what's interesting. Uh, as I was, uh, I clearly, you know, for preparations on this interview, wanted to select some material that I could read and get to know you and your your. Um, well, your, you've done very well. You've done um, very well. But reading Rebel Angels in Exile, it feels like you're writing an autobiography. And I think some people would argue, well, the angel was simply a literary device for Timothy Wiley. But I don't think that's the case when they look at your, your work as a whole or read these, um, read these books in context. Because it's very apparent that this angel is basically acting as sort of bridge between your conscious self and the historical entity that had been walking around the planet somewhat, I guess, experiencing but not recalling everything that was going on around him. Is that kind of a fair way to put it? Observing. Observing but not interacting. Um, angels can't really interact with this level is is too dense and they're too fine. Uh, so um, she's basically a watcher and observing angel. Oh, that's interesting. Watchers, yeah. yes. Forget about not, that. Not not one of the classic watchers that you find in you know in, uh, uh, Enochian sort of thinking. Okay. Um, this is different. These were the angels who were serving on the planet who went into the rebellion but who weren't pulled off because a lot of them were pulled off and taken to what really were prison planets. And these were, a lot of the ones that are coming back are coming back from these prison planets or previous incarnations. Because it takes a lot of incarnations. You see. It's not just one. It takes a lot. So from the perspective of someone like 
your angels, they have basically been present outside of the stream of humanity. They've been observing, watching, but not participating. But they have a perspective of us that is very just, detached from the, 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 the continuum, so to speak. Well, there, there are different, I mean, there are many different types of angels. Um, angels are created beings, and they're created to, uh, to fulfill specific functions. Mm -hmm. um, a, a seraphim that is created uh, as a um, guardian angel, for instance, functions as a guardian angel. And guardian angels are interesting, you know, we all have a couple. We share them, you know, in most circumstances, but, you know, we have a couple who are particularly intimately involved with us. And they will kind of, they sort of subtly steer us in directions that we need to confront in order to learn, in order to move through, um, which is why sometimes they'll steer us in the direction so we can <laughs> choose for ourselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The angels that sit on the left-hand shoulder, the hands on the right-hand shoulder. Um, but uh, Georgia came in with the first of the interventions uh, the, um, from the inner worlds, basically, uh, which came about half a million. Oh, we dropped out again. Observer. Oh, there we go. And, yes, as an observer. Um, so that's, you know, that, that basically has been our function in observing as well, you know, and watching. So relatively speaking, there's there's all these different angelic uh, orders. Oh, where do the traditional orders like oh, Lucifer, um, Raphael, Azazel, and beings like that, where do they fit into... I hate to use the term hierarchy, but I, I sense that there is a hierarchy. Where do they fit into the pantheon? No, it's fine to talk about hierarchies, um, especially when you get uh, beings who are functional beings. Um, you know, obviously an angel who takes care of, you know, a very large type of territory, um, you know, will be... I don't know if a higher in the hierarchy is the right way of saying it, but they have larger responsibilities. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, there are angels of the future, you know, angels of the churches, angels, I mean, probably more angels on the planet than our people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm terrified or comforted by that. I'll be comforted, be sure. <laughs> For um, I want to focus a little bit because uh, I see time. Gosh, this has been so much, such a fun conversation so far. To focus a little bit more on the um, well, the return of the plume serpent. This is a subject that many people will find exhilarating, and some, I would say, of a, let's say a religious mindset, will find uh, terrifying. The idea of the return of the plumed serpent, which is really kind of dovetails into the Helionk's um, work in, in, in a very interesting way. Uh, what is the return of the plumed serpent? I think that um, everything basically is returning. Um, I think it's part of what this planet is all about and it's why so many extraterrestrial races are here. Uh, I I don't know what the latest count is. Um, I've heard <laughs> over certainly I've heard over a hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually heard over. Yeah, I've heard ridiculous numbers. And, yeah, yeah, and I'm quite sure of it. You know, I mean, this is about to be at some point. You know, seriously enough, you know, one of the most important planets in in, in this particular segment of the universe, um, which is why they're here. You know, it's. Uh, I think that, I mean, you know, let, let's talk about <laughs> the possible futures. One of the things I found is it's good not to speculate too much because however clever one thinks one's speculation is, God is always not cleverer than <laughs> one is oneself. But my sense is that a number of things are going to happen simultaneously. Um, I think 
part of it is rejoining the galactic community, the realization we are part of this much, much larger frame. I think simultaneously there is going to be a return of these ancient entities, you know. I call it the big show because I, I can't think of anything else. Uh, but I, I suspect, you know, we're on our way to, um, you know, becoming a pretty cool place. But we just have to go through this, uh, this difficult period. And it's been difficult now for quite a long time, but it's particularly difficult, I think, now. And, and we're seeing, I mean, you know, if one takes note of the news, it's easy to think that, you know, things are really, really falling apart. Of course, they're not. Just individuals behaving badly and hopefully learning from it. <laughs> well, as somebody who is a com commentator as well as an observer, I've said for quite a while now that we should celebrate the falling of the part, falling apart of these systems, because people are too attached to the systems. They have, I guess, on one level, kind of served us well, but not so much, and and yet at the same time they've been sort of the, um, well, the, the the feeding bed for all manner of evil and darkness on the planet. So, you know. When I look at, for instance, the economic system and you see the venality that's been revealed, when you look at the religious structures, we go through the whole laundry list, but the bottom line is that for me, I'm looking at this from the perspective of my lifetime and realizing that, yes, this is crumbling and this is a process of things that certainly must be in order for us to get to a, a, a healthier situation. Situations crumble um, when there's no longer a need for them. I think that's the way. It's, it's, it's not the other way around. I think, um, I mean, we're seeing in, in England, for instance, the moment that, that religion as its practice has, has been crumbling. I mean, in, there's now churches where two or three people go to. Yeah. You know, there's no longer a need. Because, I mean, some people are so, you know, it's a terrible shame. But, of course, what's happening is that the, the need now comes back to us. We have to find it inside us. We can't look to a church or an authority or a government or, to do it for us anymore. We, we have to find it in ourselves. And it is a spiritual um, lesson uh, in the physical world. You know, we're spiritual beings living in the physical world. And every lesson that we get is a spiritual lesson. It may look like a physical, you know, a physical tumult or something like that, but it's a spiritual lesson, potentially a spiritual lesson. So, you know, when that lesson is no longer, no longer needed because we've transcended the need for it, uh, it, um, it fades away. And I think it's the same true for all the various different corruptions that, we, you know, that you talk about. Is that kind of the cautionary tale side of the Helianx uh, proposition? Because uh, we have the story of the Helianx as they are dealing with their world, basically going into this, this, this violent environmental disaster. And without giving too much of the storyline away, what I will say is that as I read through it, I felt like, yes, this is a journey. This was the journey of what we would basically call pro, the progenitors, and yet at the same time, it was a cautionary tale and an adaptation of a world that had been environmentally altered so much that the species itself had to adapt or perish. Yes, I, yes, that, 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 that pretty much is. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, um, I mean, the Heliacs were not a technological society. At least they weren't to start with. They were much more... Organic. Into it, internal, yeah, internal manipulation, organic. Yeah. Um, but I think any, you know, there are obviously going to be technological societies, and they're going to be non-technological. I think we can call the dolphins an intelligent race that is non-technological. In other words, when they want to leave the planet, they leave, it, they leave their bodies. You know, um, they're much more fluid. Mm -hmm. 
go. We've got a slight drop out again. Much depends on how emotionally mature that society is. And of course, the problem that we've had is that we're not emotionally mature. We're scared stiff most of the time. Um, yeah. yeah, I can see out of control most of the other time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. As a race, we're scared shitless most of the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, quite simply, look, there was a group called Itabara, um, who used to come and, and <laughs> they found a particular, uh, particularly delicious uh, fruit somewhere in the Amazon, and they would come and they would pick it up and they would take it back to their planet. They were a race of gourmands, you know. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> but they said, they said, they had a lovely little thing. They said, first make friends with your son. First make friends with your son. And what the course decoding that means, first get to come to terms with the, um, you know, atomic processes you had, you know, that, that take place in the sun. You know, make friends with them. Um, and, of course, we've used them rather differently, but uh, hopefully sooner or later we will make friends with them. Well, back to the topic for a minute of technology. Um, we tend to link te technology to hardware. I mean, technology being something external to ourselves. But effectively, we are technology, aren't we, Timothy? I mean, when yes. we begin to activate ourselves, when, and some of us come in and some of us are all wired right from the front, which is... Pfft, just be painful, but yes. um, we are technology in the sense that we possess within us faculties and um, a depth of knowledge that we're not aware of. Is that is it fair to call that technology? Is it fair to say that it is the underexploited technology that we're dealing with right now, rather than the silicon-based hardware type stuff that uh, we call technology? I think I think we could think of it more as a bridge, uh, the hardware aspect. Okay. Because I think you see, I mean, you know, take the telephone. I mean, one could say, well, on one level, using the telephone means one doesn't have to, you know, <laughs> learn telepathy. Um, or one could say uh, that the use of the telephone breeds out the, our familiarity with being able to um, pick up other people, you know. Other or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, you could see technology as a whole series of substitutes for our inner, our inner capabilities. And I think at this point now, each of us has to um, come to terms with is a piece of technology actually contributing to my inner life or is it uh, stealing um, from my inner life? Um, Yes. And I think, you know, one, one can be pretty, I mean, I don't use cell phones, for instance, for precisely that reason. You know, if they just get in the way of, uh, of um, you know, the continui continuity that I'm interested in, you know, it would be interrupted every five minutes. Well, you, you know, basically the digital technology puts you in a position where you're always on. That's the horrible thing about computers and cell phones. I mean, I have people that send me texts and they go, well, I sent you a text. And I went, yeah, okay. It's kind of like an email to me. I want to respond timely, but I don't walk around with this device on me or even on all the time. And I don't want to because I don't want to be connected into that mm -hmm. constantly. It, it drains the, it, it drains the psychic. Uh, yeah. Reservoir, in my yes. opinion. Yes, very, very sensible, Randy. I, I completely agree. I, I haven't thought it through uh, in quite that way, but you know, you're absolutely right. I just feel it you know, as a, as a an unnecessary interruption. Um, most of the interchanges are absolutely trivial and completely unnecessary. You know. Uh, yeah, well, f for most people, it's an expediency. It's a means to basically divert their attention. Yeah. Um, and we live in a world now that's so distracted because 
because of the constant buzz of technology, people no longer have, and forgive me, I've got a train in the background, so we'll, this is the uh, coal train coming down from the northern regions. <laughs> it, yeah, I, well, I live on top of a hill here that overlooks the city, and this train is at the bottom of the hill, but it sounds like it's out in the uh, backyard right now. So it's quite loud. It's, yes. I love I love trains. They're part of uh, old technology that I that I still love. But talking yeah. about the technology a little bit, um, again with with the book, you you go into some interesting concepts even in the creation of this book. Which um, you just stated this book over thirty years. Is that correct? Yes. 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 It's the <laughs> we have labor of love. Um, the actually, original story, the one on the right-hand side, the one that's calligraph, came through in a one sitting. Um, I think I had done an entheogen, and I, I was really intrigued by this, the myth of uh, Adam and Eve and the serpent. And you know, I, I, I said to myself, well, you know, we know pretty much who Adam and Eve were. But really, who the hell was this talking snake? You know, what was that all about? <laughs> and my pen started to write, you know, once upon a time, in the velvet curve of space that existed, an enchanted race of space chips. And then we just poured on. <laughs> and after about four or five hours, I, I stopped and... Uh, I thought, well, this is, this is interesting. I'd never quite had quite such an automatic writing. It, it's, it's wonderful for a writer when, you know, yes, when it stuff it writes is. itself. Mm -hmm. It's rare enough. Yes. <laughs> and this stuff just came through, boom, you know. And I thought, well, I, said, well, I think I'll illustrate it. I'll have some fun with it. And so I divided it down into the 80 pages. So I illustrated it, each one in pencil. And then... I, as computerization got better, I thought, well, you know, maybe I should do these in color. So I, did. I actually drew them in color, and then I processed them through a computer uh, to get those little broad swaths of, uh, of color. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe it needs a bit of, <laughs> a bit of um, commentary, you know. So I, I think probably in the late 80s, I started writing the commentary, and that took another 10 years. Uh, and each page, you know, the commentary is referred to each page, and it just takes everything into a far deeper level. But what's striking uh, about this to me is the continuity that you maintained over time in the creation of this, especially with the graphics. Um, like I said, I can see a continuity in your style, even going back to the Dolphins, Extraterrestrials, and Angels book. There's, there's a symmetry in all of this. And the creative flow economy. to do this is, is phenomenal. There's certainly a continuity. Um, I think probably some people think I'm doing the same thing again and again and again. But of course, I, I'm not. I'm making these minute changes. You know, each... You know, each graphic for me is a learning, you know, because I try, like writing, I try and write what I don't know. Um, and the same thing with my oh, drawing, I try and draw like what I've never, I, like I, I try and draw what I've never seen. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, in the I, beginning of the book, you detail some of this. You, the readers of this book get an opportunity to see a part of the creative process that I think a lot of times we don't get to see and what you went through in terms of rendering these and then trying to use Photoshop to do the coloring of them, which was, I guess, sort of a learning process in itself. I mean, software, and as somebody who has spent 25 years in the software field, I can tell you that every software package is a, a maze, a puzzle, a riddle, and a complete enigma by the time you're done learning it. So you, you, you go through this process... But um, um, it's quite amazing to see that in the end you went back and you, there's a quote, and I pulled this quote, and it, this is part of the creative process. I don't just interview people about uh, one subject. I'm interested in the creative process. Yeah. And you, you're quoted as saying there's a direct morphogenic wavefront created by the direct application of hand to paper. The spirit reaches through, whereas 
I'm inclined to feel that the spirit can easily get lost or become degraded in the fuzz of binary digits which separates my signal from the viewer. That is a, a statement about the creative process and digital technology that th this should be a poster. People should put this up on the wall because <laughs> as somebody who's created with computers for a long time, I still wind up going back to, I just talked to somebody this afternoon and I said something about we were trying to solve a technical problem and I said, well, what I do is I flowchart it. And he's going, oh, well, what, I use this. He's from the Netherlands. And he said, oh, well, I occasionally like to use this software. And I went, no. I said, what I do is I pull a piece of graph paper out and I take yes, this thing pencil. called a pen and I actually hand draw the flowchart. Very sensible. So, Very sensible. I, I'm so pleased to hear that because I've been going on about that for years. I, I, my, my partner or my aunt now, I call her, we do our graphics together at this point. You know, we send them back and forth. Uh -huh, she lives uh -huh. on the East Coast. Um, and um, so she got into uh, computer graphics very early on in the early 80s. Uh, I was teaching at New School. So I got a kind of insight into, uh, you know, how graphics um, work. Um, but, of course, you had to go through all the various different programs and things got more and more and more advanced. And finally, she just said she gave up. And she has a wonderful hand anyway. She's a beautiful drawer. And she's gone back to drawing. And my fear is that you know, people who get very adept at creating images on the, uh, on the computer lose, the, lose their hand, you know. They might have started with a good hand at, 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 at art yes. college. Yeah. But yeah. it can atrophy, man. No. I've written poetry and music lyrics since I was probably about 12 years old. And I have journals that go back at least that far. Wow. One of my struggles to this day is to sit down and put something that you would call a poetic idea as opposed to a flowchart or something like that um, down on a computer. I don't find the process to be organic. I don't find it to be, for me, authentic communication because I require the flow of what I'm doing here, pen to paper of being able to connect exactly what you said in that quote. There is yep. a morphogenic field that is accessed as a result of kinetic yep. motion, of our interaction yep. with a stylus and a piece of paper, however that translated, was a brush or a pen or whatever. And like yep. I said, I'm interested in the creative process as much as the information that you put down because it's very clear that you're an artist and you're a very integrated artist in terms of how you're presenting information. So I'm fascinated by the process as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. I mean, um, I, I draw, um, um, mostly, most of my books I've written longhand, right, and then typed up afterwards. Uh, when I started working with Georgia, I started the first book with Georgia longhand. And then, I, I think, she, basically, I think she said something. And I realized I had to start working on the computer. Uh, and I found now, after after doing these eight books, that I'm able actually to be able to do that now. And the way we work together, because it's really like working with a sort of a colleague sitting, you know, just behind me, you know, and she'll come up with an idea, we'll chat about it, she may come up with a sentence, you know, and they comment on it. You know, it's very much of a collaborative act as opposed to a kind of mediumistic taking dictation. Um, and working on the computer is a little bit more um, easy for me to, because I'm a very slow typist. So uh, I, it allows me to, to uh, converse with her in a way that doesn't happen when I write longhand, where generally it just simply flows, which is lovely, but um, it didn't completely work when I was working with Georgia. With Georgia. Mm. So when you're I've tried to avoid the term, but uh, I'll use it here. When you are conversing with Georgia, is, how does this differentiate from what people traditionally call channeling? I, I, the term's kind of tainted, but it's a communication with a non-physical entity, correct? Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, channeling normally is taking dictation. That's what channeling normally is, you know. You just blurt out or you write down. But yours is an uh, interaction, is that correct? Is, yeah, it's a collaboration. 
Okay. It really is. Okay. I, 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 I don't regard myself as a medium. I regard myself merely as being sensitive. Um, and it took a long time to develop a, you know, this particular relationship. Now, to go back to the point you were raising earlier, you know, as to whether other people would see it as a sort of psychological, you know, uh, uh, self-deception or uh, uh, split personality or any one of the, a number of different ways of trying to explain it. <laughs> um, I really don't like care. Like you really can, yeah, right. What I care about is, you know, that we have a damn good dialogue. You know, we can talk, we can uh, joke, we can get sentences wrong, we can get sentences right. Uh, and it really is like working with another person. Um, and I have, I've written two books with, uh, uh, one book with uh, two other people and another book with one other people. So I'm kind of used to working uh, collaboratively. I enjoy working collaboratively. Um, Everybody was, yeah, through collaboration. And I, you know, uh, yeah, it may be my unconscious mind. Who, who knows? I mean, I, I, it doesn't serve me really to go there. You know, maybe when I'm <laughs> a bit older and I, I get more curious, perhaps, you know, I'll, I'll try and get to the bottom of it. But as long as it keeps on going and Georgia tells me things that I don't know, um, and I've never come across before, then it's fine. Yeah. And it resonates, it feels right. And I always put my books, I have a, a, a person, a reader of, of mine, who's very adept with uh, dousing with a pendulum. Mm -hmm. And I send her my manuscripts, and she douses every page, every sentence, and she feeds back to me, you know, what is, um, um, what is reliable and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And I make the necessary corrections. That's interesting. That's very interesting. What I was trying to, what I was really looking at, I guess, was from my standpoint, understanding how you work. Um, I became very interested in what I guess you would call mediumship, non non physical to human re, uh, communication, because again, when I was a teenager, I was very influenced by the Seth material, Jane Roberts' work, and sure. I, I still read still occasionally go back and read um, the Seth material because I find that it's still unfolding, much as I think George's material and your work is unfolding. I, you, you said about the Arantia book earlier, it was a book that would be read for, you know, 200 years from now because it is still unfolding. It is a work that basically transcends the, the present space and time. Yeah. And so when I look at material that's coming from what, what I just tend to call non-physical entities. Um, I'm very interested in the individual process of, you know, who is sending the information or, and, and you said it very interestingly, Tim, Timothy, because you said that you're collaborators. I've never really heard anybody say that before in terms of people who would be what you would call uh, mediums or channels. Um, generally, it is kind of like, um, even though it's back and forth, it's not the kind of dialogue that you appear to have with your angels in terms of the, the communication that you're doing. No, it, it is actually quite different. Um, when I, after my near death experience, right, in 1973, you know, it just com completely changed my life, except I couldn't change my life. I was locked into a situation which I had to, I had to kind of find my way out of. Uh, but by, 19, uh, by 1981, I found myself in a situation in Canada where a small group of friends um, had uh, one of the, um, the angels had basically broken through one of them. Uh, one of them was a, a natural medium, uh, not a full trance medium, but a semi trance medium. In other words, he was aware, but you know, the angels would talk through him. Mm -hmm. And um, after we spent 11 days talking with the angels, and that forms quite a, a substantial part of the last few chapters of my first book, um, the angels said, listen, you know, anybody can do this. You know, you, you don't have to come and listen to some, some medium. You know, you can do this for yourself. So I took that seriously, and I went back to my house in New York, and I spent the next two years basically um, training myself to be able to speak and um, 
basically take dictation from my um, uh, from my, my my two angels, or at least one of the angels. So I got to know very well. Um, so that was basically sort of that dictate. That was that mediumistic stage, you know. But then I think one grows out of this, you know, because my relationship with the angels has always been. I don't say combative exactly, but it's always been like, who are you? What are you up to? What are you doing? You know, it's more. You know, I'm the guy who's a back person. and forth type. Of yeah, I, know I'm, I'm, I think they probably think I'm a little pushy, but um, I find that's the way of getting information. I like out. it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and you do see this um, probably less so in, in the Seth material. But there was that that give and take as well, and you know I don't know if you're. Well, I think so. Yeah, I th I think that she had a much more uh, relationship with um, with whoever Seth or whoever George she was yeah. in contact yeah. with, and much more like the one I had with Georgia than she was merely taking dictation. I actually um, knew her publisher pretty well. He published some of my early articles. So, um, you know, I got to know the inside of the material, and I thought it was terrific material. Yes, it was, yeah. and it was cutting edge for the time. I mean, before that, my only other familiarity with it was really Edgar Casey, which my father had actually inadvertently turned me on to when I was a kid because I found the Sleeping, Sleeping Prophet book mm -hmm. in, in his study, and sure. I stole it and read it. And I became, you know, truthfully... Um, I think for me, I've always had an interest in this because I've always had a connection to something that was outside yeah. of myself and yet inside of myself, which is kind of exactly. a weird, weird paradox. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I think Casey, you see, I think a lot of those um, people from that particular period, uh, you know, had very specific tasks, you know, mm -hmm. to open things up. Mm -hmm. I mean, something like Crowley, for instance, you know, you could sort of paint Crowley as sort of this mad creature. But basically, I mean, he really broke open and broke down the sort of the hold that the church had on, you know, on so many people, you know, for such a long time. So that was kind of his function. It didn't, I mean, the magic really didn't matter so much. But his function really was just to break open, you know, all the, uh, all this all worthless dogma. And I think Casey's uh, function really was to bring in, into reality reincarnation. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. yeah, and he did it by using um, the King James Bible, which was the foundation stone of fundamentalists. So basically, through the back door, Casey kind of stealthed the whole concept right into Christianity. It was, it's yeah. a very good, very astute observation. And, it, I mean, I think it was until the 4th century, wasn't it? Um, that uh, reincarnation was included in, in Christianity. Yes, it was. There was really, you know, there was some later edict that emitted from some pope that they never really disproved it. And honestly, you can go back in the plain read it of the scriptures and read yes. where Jesus says that John, John the Baptist was basically Elijah. Um, and, you know, you can get trapped by the words there, but I've gone back even through the sure. Greek translations and discovered that there's no way around it. Um, yeah. We have reincarnational aspects in a lot of the characters in the Bible, especially the prophets. So, um, yeah. you know, it was an interesting way to bring that all in. And Casey was basically anticipating what we what we call the Aquarian Age, the, the, the period sure. that was the time that you came through, the crossroads that you stood in, that kind mm -hmm. of transitioned into the period of time that I grew up in in the late 60s and early 70s. So this yeah. tumult yeah. that occurred um, yeah. on every front on, on the planet, which just went through, you know, spasms and convulsions has continued even, even to now. I mean, we're just going through it. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah very much so. Um, yeah, I think probably, you know, if we look back some 200 years in the future, this particular sort of 60-year slot between, you know, the 60s and uh, 2020, I think will be seen as absolutely pivotal. Absolutely pivotal. Yeah, I do too. I do too, and I've always had the sense of that. Even, gosh, even as a kid, I, I you know, I, I think there were, I had a sense of that. Yes. Um, it was I, curious, uh, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> from what you're talking about, I think we must have lived parallel lives in some way. In some way, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, this kind of the... But there's a lot of souls out there that, you know, I talk to a lot of people. And mm -hmm. um, while we're few in numbers, it seems, because we don't know each other, there's a lot of people that are in this process. There are a lot of yeah. people who... I've said they're looking for the others because basically yeah. it's a lonely process. And mm -hmm. most of us are isolated by, usually by choice, just because, as I said earlier, can't take yeah. the noise. Um, yeah. Me doing this show is kind of my way of publicly yeah. sticking it out there because otherwise I'd have nobody to talk to. So, <laughs> Well, you know, I think there is a purpose in uh, being separate. And it's such fun when we all get together, you know, because <laughs> I mean, it is. every once in a while, it is. It's, you know. But actually, functionally, it's more important that we function separately because, in a sense, we kind of exude a particular kind of aura that does change things around us. Um, you know, I'm old enough now to have been able to notice it over the years, you know, that, uh, that things do change. Yes. Um, I'm sure you have probably have the same experience. One doesn't have to do very much. One just has to be in the right place at the right time. Um, that really, that's what magic is, as far as I'm concerned, is being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. I, remember, I remember once, <laughs> I was in New York, <coughs> and I had a terrible row with my girlfriend, and I had left the house, and was walking, and it was very, very windy, and I, and I was just walking up the street, I came to a corner, and I should say, but I had taken some acid, by the way, I should say. <laughs> and, and it's just a small which detail. Is, which is what which annoys my girlfriend. And, <laughs> um, and um, I just came, I came out this corner, uh, and a, a small child, a baby, came hurtling about four foot off the ground, parallel to the ground, blown by the wind. Oh my gosh. He was roaring down. And I just stepped forward and I caught the little bugger. I caught this baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know where the reflexes came from. It was just like, you know, because the baby was being, had been blown out of a pram that had been pushed by some poor benighted <laughs> <laughs> nanny um, around the corner. I hadn't seen it coming out of the, the thing. I was just in the right place at the right time to catch the little thing. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Essence. <laughs> yeah. We basically just walk through this gigantic theater, and every once in a while we walk onto the stage, and there it is. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's the scene. Stuck men are yeah. in place, the light's there, and boom, you do it. <laughs> I think, it, it, you know, the best thing for any magician is just simply to, you know, ask to be in the right place at the right time. That's Absolutely. all that's required of us. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's actually a really good thought to kind of leave this. Gosh, I hate to call this an interview. This is this was just such a fun conversation, um, oh, and, I, and I think we kind of got a little bit of a connection going in terms of you know communicating some things. Um, certainly, certainly. No, I mean it's, it's, it's just wonderful talking to an old friend. You know? Yeah, it kind of <laughs> is. No, very much so. It very much is. Um, but and you see, each, each generation climbs on the shoulders of the preceding that's exactly generation. Exactly right. That's exactly right, Timothy. You know, yeah. so you're probably I don't know, 20, 30 years younger than I am. You know, and you got you got you got some wonderful experiences. Well, I, I look forward to the day when somebody cares enough to ask me about my life, and I can only hope it's as interesting as yours has been so far. <laughs> well, just yes. Keep your eyes open and keep notes. <laughs> It's been a real pleasure, man. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. And thank you so much for, just for to expressing so much interest. Yeah, just to wrap up a little bit of the business side of this, let people know where they can find you and let people know how they can find um, your books, specifically the book that we've uh, kind of focused on tonight, which is the Helion's Proposition. Uh, yeah, it's uh, available through bookstores. Um, Amazon, I think, has it, a uh, publisher. Um, and my, uh, uh, what do you call it, site here? The website, is, uh, yeah. The website, that's right. It's just tw at timothywiley.com. 
W-Y-L-L-I-E dot com. That's one word, obviously. Simply Wiley. And you're very welcome to come. And, and, yeah. and we shall. I know that the I know that the listeners and viewers who see this will have an interest in uh, the things that we've talked about. Timothy Wiley, thank you for joining us on Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV, and uh, gosh, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. It's been an awesome conversation. Yes, you. It's been a real pleasure for me, and thank you, thank you so much for taking it all. In your stride and taking, oh, you know, I, I loved it. I loved it. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Morgan. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. We'll be back with another show very soon. <laughs> <laughs>